beginning with Dr. Corey Slovis. Most everybody in emergency medicine knows Dr. Slovis and has learned from Dr. Slovis in some way. Uh, Corey is professor of emergency medicine and chairman of emergency medicine at Vanderbilt, and he's going to kick things off with acute coronary syndrome. So as Corey likes to say, giddy up, right? Thank you very much, Amal. Certainly uh, at least a legend in my own mind. So I want to talk about our bread and butter, and that is uh, essential actions in diagnosing and treating the chest pain patient who uh, often has or sometimes doesn't have ACS. First concept I want to stress is that if we don't recognize ACS and MI early on, mortality doubles. We have got to see it quickly, and I think patients are screwing with our heads. And so I'm not going to talk about angina. I'm going to say that atypical is typical, and you shouldn't be surprised by it. Patients often present with symptoms that are inconsistent or sort of don't look like but could be ischemic heart disease. And this article from uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association I think is essential reading, not every word, but the message and what they did is they looked at every single paper that has ever been done on acute myocardial infarction and said what variables predict, don't predict, and eliminate the likelihood of an MI. And the quote is up there and I will read it to you. No single element of the chest pain history is a powerful enough predictor of non-ACS non or non-AMI to allow clinicians to make a decision solely based on it. Don't hang on the fact that it lasted too long. It was positional. It was atypical. Atypical is typical. Uh, this, the GRACE study, they found that almost 1 in 10 patients who were diagnosed with MI had atypical symptoms and did not, in fact, have chest pain. Be careful. They, Patients with MI don't have to have chest pain. Patients are non-compliant. They refuse to read the textbooks. They refuse to study for the boards, and they come in with atypical symptoms. If you miss it early on, especially if they come in without chest pain, mortality increases significantly. Here you can see it, it almost tripled. And so this is an equation that we should all know. As age goes up, chest pain goes down. And in patients over the age of 70 or so, which I'm unfortunately getting closer and closer to, even sleeping in a hyperbaric chamber, um, be aware that chest pain becomes less of a symptom rather than a more common symptom. For those of you that have an open ED, let me encourage you to close it off to the elderly. The elderly are the most non-compliant patients around. We need to guard against them. And that's because they refuse to come in with chest pain, but they'll come in with other symptoms. And I think in my religion there are five causes, five steps, five reasons for everything. Therefore, we ought to have five atypical symptoms that as soon as you're thinking of them, you're saying, this could be an MI. Dysmia. New onset dysmia or acutely worsening dysmia that is not readily explained by the patient has a long history of COPD and it's exactly like their old COPD. Be careful. Dyspnea is the number one symptom, the number one in quotes atypical symptom for an MI, especially in the elderly, more common in women than men. Diaphoresis. Unless it's a really hot day and the patient just came in from running, diaphoretic patients, giddy up. You're thinking of a number of things. One of them ought to be AMI. Certainly you could think of sepsis too based on Sarah's video. Syncope, near syncope, some alteration in mental status. They've even described giddiness. If a patient is laughing too much at my jokes, write to the cath lab. Nausea, less vomiting, but nausea or vague abdominal symptoms, it's n always consider an older person. Could it be ischemia? I always get an ECG in classic abdominal pain in the elderly. And then lastly, not feeling right or just weak. Next essential action, you must ask the dissection questions. There ought to be five, there are just three. Was it tearing or ripping? Did it start at maximal intensity? Is ischemia usually builds up, a dissection, tearing, ripping pain, 10 over 10. And then did it move up, down, back, up into the neck, into the back, down into the abdomen? How's your chest pain? Oh, my chest pain is much better. My back is killing me. Whoa, mama, be careful.
Many of us don't ask any of the questions. If you ask all three in one study, up to 90% of dissections were ultimately diagnosed. Now, you have one of the international grandmasters in ECG teaching, and that's Amal. Amal and others look at an EKG, they see it, they know it, they're talking to you about vectors, not so much for me. And so I want to talk a little bit about ECG diagnosis. There are five ways to diagnose an MI by EKG. Now, certainly this classic one, uh, I'm looking up here, but that's me, it's down here. Uh, a millimeter of ST elevation in two or more anatomically contiguous leads. But if you look at patients that have that with chest pain, up to a third have no ischemia or infarction. When, however, you add that to reciprocal changes, ST depression in anatomically opposite leads and or Q waves, you're now in the 90 to 95 percent bracket. And that's what good doctors do. They look at those three changes. But we know that there are five causes, five steps, or five reasons. And so there are two more steps that I would urge you to adopt if you were not already doing them. Number one, compare the EKG to a prior EKG. And for those of you that study the Bible, you know that one ECG, that's non-diagnostic, begets another. If you have an ECG in a patient that you're at all suspicious of, 5, 10, 15 minutes later, 20 minutes later, or if they develop chest pain or their symptoms changing, changes, one ECG should beget another. One ECG, go get another one. I know we charge a lot of money for ECGs, but they, how much do they cost? A dollar? Just leave the leads on and repeat it. Now, if you really want to screw with your partners, move the leads a little bit and say, my God, it's changed. So leave the leads where they are. None of us want to get sued. And worse, none of us want to lose. But many of us have seen good doctors fail to do this essential action. And that is, patients don't always come back to the same hospital. Spend the time to compare the ECG you're looking at, if it's at all abnormal, just a little bit, with a prior ECG from the patient. Fax is very nice, and medical records works 24 hours a day. The other thing is you can have what's called pseudo-normalization, and as the patient is uh, progressing through his or her ischemic episode, the ECG may look better when, in fact, <clears throat> it's evolving. Be careful. Get the old EKG. Now, <clears throat> real electrocardiographers can look at an ECG and discuss it. I am not one, and so I confess to you that I'm not good enough to look at 12 leads at a time. And so when I'm all done reading the EKG, when I've done my gestalt and I've looked for MI, whenever I'm evaluating a patient who could potentially have ischemia with typical or atypical symptoms, I do five things. All right, I'm sort of done. Now I go back and I look at two or three leads at a time. And so I look, two, three, and F. Could this be an inferior MI? And I just focus on those three leads. I look at one and L. Could this be an occult lateral MI? I move down the chest, be one, two, three, be four, five, six, three at a time. And then as a final thing, I go back and I look at V1, V2 especially for deep ST depression, not ST elevation. Five quick reads, take you two to five seconds on each one of them, but it could really save you from missing an MI. All right, so here's an EKG. It is essentially normal. This was atypical chest pain, and so I would say no acute ischemia. Are we good with that? You could say one ECG begets another, or you could add arrows. Arrows are good. And this is a, a very subtle lateral MI. Many of you saw it, some of you didn't. But if you went back and looked specifically at 1 and L, after you did the inferior leads or after you did the anterior leads, you wouldn't miss it. Here's another one. Here's a, a fairly classic inferior MI. But it also has a posterior MI. This is going to tell me this patient uh, maybe will, is going to do worse. It's going to tell me this patient is going to be much more sensitive to nitroglycerin. And so I've learned the criteria for posterior MI. And I pick that up by my fifth thing, looking at V1, V2. There was some depression, R greater than S, the T wave is up. 
Comments on this one? Well, this is not really an MI, but this is called Wellens Warning. You can see that biphasic where the arrows are, this up and down. It's not technically an MI, but in a chest pain patient, this biphasic ST, ST up, T wave down, this roller coaster, this biphasic event, be thinking about a high LAD lesion about to occlude. I don't know about this one. I guess it has a little ST depression. I should have looked at this more closely. Uh, reading for MI, I don't see an MI. Hello, what's this? And so AVR, I always thought it was an 11 lead ECG. Apparently it's now a 12 lead. Be aware that ST elevation and AVR, just isolated elevation, may portend disaster if you miss it. So ST elevation in AVR only, especially with diffuse ST, uh, ST depression throughout the EKG, be thinking about a left main lesion or a left main proximal LAD lesion. Just look for ST elevation, 2, 3, and F, anterior 1, 2, 3, anterior 4, 5, 6, 1 and L, then go back to V1, V2. Is there any subtle ST elevation? Is there any subtle ST depression? Look at AVR. AVR is a forgotten lead. I've told you one ECG begets another. I want to talk a little bit about treatment now. There are certain truisms for ischemic chest pain. Time equals muscle. The longer you take to reperfuse, the worse people do. Shock equals volume. V-fib equals shock. But if you have someone who's hypotensive, give them the volume challenge. They're 22, they've just been in a road race, two liter volume challenge. They're 82 and they have chest pain, 100 or 200 cc's rapidly in, don't follow blood pressure unless you have an art line in. Does their pulse go up? No more volume. Does their pulse go down? Give them more. And pain equals ischemia. Until you prove otherwise, if someone's having chest pain, it's ischemia until proven otherwise. There are, of course, five drugs or families of drugs. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through all of the drugs for acute myocardial infarction other than to say we attack the platelet, aspirin and Plavix. Two B3As are going to be in the PCI lab or not. Nitroglycerin, if indicated. Lytiker lab, I'll talk a little bit about making that decision. Heparin or heparinoid. Many centers use unfractionated heparin and follow the bleeding time, clotting times, etc. cetera, uh, in, in the cath uh, lab. Other centers use low molecular weight heparin, don't follow anything. And then beta blockers whose role has changed. Morphine is no longer an essential drug. I'm not saying we don't give it. But be aware there is at least retrospective data, there is database data, there's registry data that morphine may be a myocardial depressant, it may decrease rather than, it may increase mortality rather than decrease it. Pain equals ischemia, aggressively attack the ischemia. Uh, here is uh, one from the American Heart Journal, and you can see that people that got morphine uh, did worse, regardless of whether <clears throat> uh, they had a larger or smaller infarct, regardless of whether they had pulmonary edema or not. It has been moved down. It is still used. Many of us are using fentanyl. Be aware that there's some uh, data on uh, using even uh, a benzodiazepine. Aspirin. So for me, the rule is aspirin unless allergic. And allergic is their lips got so swollen they couldn't hear because they were covering their ears. If someone says, I'm allergic to aspirin, it makes my stomach hurt, they're getting the aspirin. They can handle one dose. And Plavix unless bleeding. Heparin, they get the finger. For Plavix, they get the question, have you had a change in stool? Uh, are you bleeding? Do you have a history of bleeding? Nitrates are outstanding. Nitrates decrease preload. They decrease afterload. They decrease O2 consumption. They vasodilate ischemic coronary arteries. And we used to think it decreased mortality. Unfortunately, nitroglycerin in and of itself does not decrease mortality. If someone is borderline or hypotensive, you don't have to give it to them. It's not going to change their mortality. Of course, there are five causes of acute hypotension with nitroglycerin. If someone gets acutely hypotensive, tilt them, volume, take away the nitroglycerin. Obviously, 
the first thought is a right ventricular infarct. Right ventricle, stiff, they get nitroglycerin, they vasodilate, preload falls away, hypotensive. And then there are four more. The same mechanism as an RV infarct, relative or absolute volume deficiency. You remember Jack Nicholson almost had a tragic death when Keanu Reeves was going to give him the nitroglycerin. Be careful. People that have used erectile dysfunction drugs, people that have used another vasodilator are very predisposed to it. And I always mix this up. Are you supposed to ask women ab about erectile dysfunction drugs? Absolutely. Because although they're not using it for erectile dysfunction, and I'm not making a value judgment there, be aware that for primary pulmonary hypertension, Sudenafil is used, and it, if you're at a center that sees a lot of uh, patients with uh, pulmonary hypertension, patients may be using it. And then some people are sensitive to it, and there's a rare reflex. Nitroglycerin does not improve mortality. When in doubt, don't give it. As far as lytic versus lab, I just want to briefly touch on it. There are two time points. Time point number one, is it a hyperacute MI under three hours? Or is it an acute MI, the symptoms began greater than three hours before they came to see you? If it's a hyperacute MI, we're going to have to make a decision. If it's more than three hours from when the symptoms began, they're best treated with PCI, even if you have to transfer them. But if you're dealing with a patient with a hyperacute MI, symptoms within three hours of coming to you, and you cannot get them to a PCI lab so that a balloon is in and ready to, and inflated in under 90 minutes, D2B under 90 minutes, in a hyperacute MI, if you have an uncomplicated patient, lytics work better. So be aware PCI opens more arteries. It mo opens more arteries better. But time is muscle in a hyperacute MI. An MI started out at one of the gambling tables. Uh, right after getting uh, two or three blackjacks in a row at the $100 table. By the way, I, I got up about 5 this morning at 5.15. I couldn't believe how many people are playing at the $100 tables. We're, we're like, we're doing the wrong thing this morning. But, I, you know, but maybe at lunch we go. If you have a hyperacute MI and you cannot get someone to the cath lab quickly and it's an uncomplicated, a kill up one MI, lytics are better. As far as beta blockers, beta blockers used to be how we were measured. IV beta blocker in the ED and less com contraindications. Uh, wheezes uh, less than uh, one third, of, uh, rails less than one third of the way up. They're getting the lytic, uh, they're getting the beta blocker. We now know that although beta blockers are outstanding overall, in the first 12 to 24 hours, there are a lot of myocardiums that are tenuous. They're stunned. Beta blockers, IV beta blockers acutely, are no longer indicated. After the echo, after they're stable, after you know their ejection fraction, then they can get beta blockers. But in the ED acutely or on the ambulance, no. I wanted to do two more things and then we'll stop. Number one is to talk about the swan gans and how you can use the swan gans catheter in your ED to make some decisions on MI patients or, or upstairs and then talk about therapeutic hypothermia. You can divide MI patients, not using a swan and, a, and an ejection fraction, but just looking at blood pressure perfusion and looking at wet or dry lungs to divide MIs into four groups. You could probably make five, like if, if they have a little bit of everything, then there's the fifth group, so it doesn't violate the rule of five. Do they have good or bad blood pressure? Are their lungs wet or dry? Are they well perfused or not? Are their lungs clear? Four groups. And obviously, this bottom group who's hypotensive and wet, their cardiogenic shock, they're going to do bad. So for, for the patient who is this straightforward MI, we've already talked about it, aspirin and Plavix, nitroglycerin, unless uh, you're worried about their blood pressure, it starts to fall, lytic or lab, they're going to get a heparin or heparinoid, and we're going to have to deal with pain control. If, however, they are hypotensive, what we're thinking about is, can we move them up? Then, rather than nitroglycerin, we go to volume. Now, how about this group? The patient is well perfused, good blood pressure, but you listen to them. They have some wheezes, some rails. They have wet lungs. Here, nitroglycerin is our key. 
clear lungs hypotensive instead of nitroglycerin volume, wet lungs but well perfused, aggressive nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin in chest pain, as soon as the chest pain goes away, we titrate it down. Nitroglycerin in pulmonary edema, you keep going up 10, 20, 30. Try to get in that 40, 50, 60 microgram per minute nitroglycerin unless their blood pressure won't hold or they have the worst headache of their life. And I think the worst headache of their life is actually going to be in another lecture, so I don't want to go there. As far as morphine, use morphine less in pain. Morphine has no role in pulmonary edema. It's bad to make dogmatic statements, especially in a large group. Morphine has no role in pulmonary edema. No study has ever shown its benefit. Multiple studies have shown it is dangerous. It increases respiratory failure. It increases death. It increases the need to be intubated. Just say no. CPAP, although Chest pain and CPAP, not so much. If you have someone in pulmonary edema and they are not controlled with your nitrates, go to CPAP. So for 2012, as far as pulmonary edema, oxygen, aggressive use of nitrates. Beta agonist, only if wheezing. Lasix, the, the drug of the devil, only if you're absolutely positively sure it's pulmonary edema and they're not controlled. And then think about BiPAP or CPAP. Last topic and then I'll summarize. Therapeutic hypothermia. Although this was studied a number of years ago, although it's been indicated for a number of years, it's only been about the past two years that most centers are either using it or transferring people. Here is the current recommendations, American Heart Association, comatose adult patients not responding in a meaningful way to verbal commands with spontaneous circulation after an out-of-hospital arrest or even in hospital rest, should be cooled to 32 or 34 degrees for at least 12 hours. Most centers do 24. <clears throat> if you do it, and this is out of the Cochrane Review, with conventional cooling methods, patients were more likely to leave the hospital without major brain damage, almost 12-fold more likely, and they were more likely to survive, 1.35. Two studies. First one, this is an Australian study. It's a before and after study. Survival to discharge went from 39 to 64%. Good neuro outcome went from 29 to 57%, an essentially doubling of the likelihood of leaving normal in post-arrest patients who came to the ED. Now, you're probably saying, but this was the MI talk. What, what are you going with this? So I want to close with this study and then summarize. And this is a, the PROCAT study. This is uh, a, a Parisian study. What they did is they looked to see is the current standard of care, if someone has an out-of-hospital arrest, they go immediately to PCI looking for an MI, and if they're unconscious, not only do they go for immediate PCI, but they also get therapeutic hypothermia. <clears throat> so, not surprisingly, 96% of people who had ST elevation post-VF or VT arrest had an MI. Okay, I would have thought it was even 100%, or at least had a balloon of lesion. But I'm telling you about this study because it has changed my thoughts on how I want every patient treated, and in fact, how we do it at our center. If someone has an out-of-hospital VF or VT arrest, they absolutely positively have to go to the cath lab, even if their EKG does not show an MI. In this study, almost 6 out of 10, 58% of people without ST elevation had an acutely balloonable, acutely stentable lesion. Now, as far as how does that therapy affect patients, take a look. If you have standard care uh, with ST elevation, your mortality, uh, your survival goes from 31% to 54%. If you have no ST elevation, it goes from 31% to 47%. And so this, this is the equation now. If you have a VF or VT arrest, you need to go for immediate PCI, regardless of whether you have ST elevation or not. And if you have a VF, VT arrest, and you're comatose, not only do you go for PCI, but you go for therapeutic hypothermia. Those are essential actions. Cardiac arrest, pulse back, VF, VT arrest, to the lab. I didn't say someone has a prolonged asystolic arrest, VF, VT. I want to summarize and stop. Number one, 
Atypical is typical. Do not get locked in on chest pain or no chest pain. Be thinking about the five essential symptoms, especially dyspnea, diaphoresis, not feeling right, vague abdominal stuff, syncope, presyncope. Uh, an elderly patient with a presyncopal episode, but they're looking pretty good. Be thinking, could this be an MI? Tearing or ripping, maximal intensity, didn't move. Ask the three dissection questions. Please look at the old EKG. There are five, act, five ways to diagnose it. The final two are compare it to an old one or compare it to a new one. One ECG begets another. Time is muscle. And this is my last slide, and this is for us, not for our patients, because we don't want to be a patient. Number one, I, I'm not saying, I, I don't want to get caught here. You don't have to do all five. If you take a, this from column B, you don't have to do the column A ones. All of us need to be thinking about those two as we age. We have to get exercise. Find some exercise you like. Fish, whether you like it or not, you need to be eating it probably twice a week. I'm not saying you have to be radical and eliminate saturated fats, but you need to decrease them. We need to eat less. And I say that. I, my hospital cafeteria, they fry everything. You can get French fries, and they say, how would you like them? Refried? I mean, we got everything fried. And then finally, here we are in Vegas. You have to find relaxation. It, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be reading or not reading, gambling or not gambling. But we've got to do something for ourselves, which I guess is why you're here. This is how we find relaxation. Thank you very much. It has been my pleasure.